Before we get started, I got a couple thank yous to send out to those that have used the Sports KC offer to buy a subscription and to those who rated and reviewed us on their podcast apps. You're our heroes. Thanks a lot. I mean, I enjoy it. Obviously, I've had a, you know, we've had pretty good success. I've had a good year, you know, winning a championship and winning a gold medal, uh, you know, but it's, it, and my wife is, is happy, loves Manhattan. So as long as my health is good and, and we're enjoying what we do, I enjoy working with young men. And if we keep good quality kids in the program that you can work with and feel good about, you know, I, I don't see any reason to retire soon. I still feel young. I still feel like I have as, I don't know if I have quite as much energy. I used to be able to stay up till two or three. Now, now one, you know, midnight, one o'clock, I'm, I'm a little bit drained, but, uh, you know, I, I, I still feel like I got the energy to keep coach. That was Kansas State coach Bruce Weber in an exclusive interview with Kellis Robinette. You'll hear more of Kellis's interview with the coach of the defending Big 12 champion Wildcats in just a moment on Sports Beat KC, the daily sports podcast presented by Big O Tires. It's Wednesday, October 16th, and you're getting some college football and basketball talk today. The star's Jesse Newell covers Kansas, provides the update of KU's latest basketball commitment, and tells us why this is an important get for the Jayhawks. And columnist Fahey Gregorian stops by to talk about the new entry in the AP Top 25 football poll, the Missouri Tigers. And guess where Mizzou resides in the SEC East standing? Let's pick up with Kellis Robinette's conversation with Bruce Weber. You've had quite a bit of recruiting success the past couple weeks. What do you attribute to that? Why have you guys been so good? Oh, I just, you know, I got to give credit to our coaches. They've done a great job of of getting, getting out and creating positive relationships, you know, We've always felt like if we could get kids to campus, uh, we're usually in, we get a chance. You know, we have a great, we have great facilities. I think the the people, the relationships are, you know, our basketball family. I think all does, you know, are positive factors in trying to get them. Now it's trying to, you know, it's not always easy to get the kids to come to campus, but uh, we've been able to focus on the right guys and get them to campus, and um, we've had some success. On paper, this looks like it should be your top-rated class at Kansas State. I mean, how excited are you about it? Oh, we're excited. There's no doubt. You you know, we kind of had some guys we uh, knew we wanted, and we focused on those guys. And like I said, our coaches did a great job with them. Our players do a good job helping out when kids come to campus, you know, and, and so I, you know, you feel good, but you know, it's obviously until they get here and prove it, you know, it, it really doesn't mean a whole lot, but you know, on paper, like you said, it's a, it's a good class and, and it's really meeting all our needs that we kind of had uh, focused on in the first place. Has the success you guys have had the last two seasons given you a recruiting bump, you feel like? I don't think there's any doubt that it's helped. Uh, I mean, we've gotten some nice exposure. Um, I, I wouldn't say we're a household name, but we still, you know, we're, you know, I think we have some respect now. Um, you know, it, it, it helps. There's no doubt, but, you know, but I still, at the same time, we have funny story of uh, trying to recruit a, a kid from Kansas city. And I, I, we were struggling and, I asked him who won the Big 12 last year, and he gave me three answers, and none of them was us. And so obviously we we weren't we weren't a household name with him. Okay, well that's interesting. When uh, coaches have success like you guys have it, the past couple of years, inevitably you know some other job offers come up, up and stuff. I don't think I've ever asked you this before, but have you ever gotten any? interest elsewhere since you've been the K-State coach? Yeah, I mean, I've had I've had calls since I've been here and reaching out just to see if you have an interest or whatever, but we, we like I said earlier, we love Manhattan. We love the opportunity to be at K-State. Uh, for us, it's a great situation. We have, you know, the we have, we've developed really, really positive friends and relationships, and um, so we're happy, and you know, I hopefully we're this is a place I can finish out and you know, you, in coaching very few guys finish on their own terms and um, you know, that 
I guess if I had a goal, that would be one of them. But, you know, I, I just still appreciate being at Kansas State and all the all the opportunities and success we've had. So you've been at K-State, Illinois, Purdue, Southern Illinois. Um, what separates K-State from those places? I know they're all different, but what kind of makes K-State unique yeah, and why do you think you've had success here? To me, the people. I, I You know, and I know – I don't want to say it's a, you know, Coach Snyder always, when he, I heard that quote for the first time, I didn't understand it till I was here. And, and once I got here, it, it, it's so true. Um, you know, the, the people, they, they care, it's a good place to be part of. And uh, I think that's very similar to Purdue, to be honest. It's very similar, you know, similar type of people and passion and, you know, so it's, uh, and I, you know, I liked all the places that I was, I've been at. You know, you you hope when you leave, you still have friends and relationships. And and I've been very fortunate. Even Western Kentucky, I still talk to people that were there when we were there 40, 41 years ago. So. Very nice. Well, when you look at this season, um, everybody's obviously really excited about Dejuan Gordon. Has he exceeded your expectations since he's been on campus? Yes, he he's good. He's a good player. Um, I I worried about him, you know, just you know, he's strong and all that stuff. Uh, but he is uh, definitely uh, he he loves the game, and I he's not Barry, but he's a lot like Barry in his mentality and uh, how he approaches every day and how he loves the game and he plays it with a passion. So it's that part of it's very very positive. How do you see yourself handling the point guard role this season? I know there are a lot of guys you could put there. Do you have a feel on that yet? Um, you know, well, I think all of them. I think it's the positive we have that, you know, that the, they all can play point to get The more guys you can have that can dribble, pass, and shoot, uh, the better off you're going to be. And and so I think it's, hopefully it's a, a positive. We can move Cardi from, you know, the, the point to the two and allow him to – have some freedom, so it it, it gives us a, a nice advantage. Okay. Do you have a, f- a good feel on what your starting lineup might be yet? Oh, I mean, I know you're basically, you're, obviously you're seniors, you're older guys, you feel pretty good about. Um, you know, after that, I do, we're, we'll have a lot of different people. We'll probably be rotating. I, I hope, and I've said all along, I hope our depth is, is, the, is our best thing about us, and but we'll have to see about that. With with Xavier Sneed, um, I know he's a guy you've utilized as a three and the four in the past. Is that something you want to keep doing, using him as a versatile player? Uh, or do you see him more at one spot now? We'll just have to wait and see, uh, to be honest. And, you know, okay. I, I really want to play him at the three as much as possible, but I think we can take advantage, and I hope he wants to take advantage and, and have some success and play some small ball, but – you know, I, he's a natural three, and that's where we'd like to keep him. Okay. And um, last one for you here. I'm, I'm proud we were able to fit these all in, but you had a lot of older players come back and join your staff now. Um, you got Shone and Henriquez on there now. What's that been like to have that relationship with former players and have them want to come back and support the team? Well, it's one of the things I'm real proud of as a coach, that we get guys that want to be in coaching is – and they, you know, it, that part of it's very positive. Um, and it's great for them to, uh, you know, with, when you talk about success recruiting, to have those guys there to sell the program. I mean, we had a year ago that we'd sit with recruits, and we one of them said, I played from at Southern Illinois, I played from at Illinois, I played for them at uh, Kansas State. So, and they said, we, and coaches, you know, been there for us and helped us. So it's, it's been positive, and they know what we really want from our guys. And uh, so I think it's, it's a great thing. I, I'm happy, and I love having our guys there. All right, awesome. Well, th- thanks so much for squeezing me in your schedule, Bruce. When we return, we'll hear from Jesse Newell on KU. When it comes to saving you money on tires, nobody does it better than Big O Tires. Like saving you up to $120 on select sets of Goodyear, Yokohama, Pirelli, and Continental tires now through November 3rd. 
That's $70 off instantly, plus up to $50 back by mail-in rebate when you purchase using your Big O Tires card. Hurry into Big O Tires and see how much you can save. Big O Tires, the team you trust. For the location nearest you, go to BigOtires.com. Jesse Newell covers Kansas uh, for the Star and Wichita Eagle. He joins us. And there was some basketball news this week, Jesse, with the, um, the commitment of a basketball player, Tyon Grant Foster. Grant Foster being hyphenated. Tyon, T-Y-O-N. We think that's the correct pronunciation of the first name, right? That's correct, yes. I'll tell you what, if, uh, if Grant Foster doesn't have a contract with Foster Grant's eyewear at some point <laughs> in his career, then an opportunity has been missed. But this is a good, um, this is a good, good news for Kansas. Uh, to get a basketball commitment, and it's significant because it's the first one since the bad news of, of NCAA trouble for KU. So uh, put it in perspective, Jesse. What, what does it mean that, um, that a player, six foot seven, kind of wing guy who played high school basketball at Schlegel in Kansas City and is at Indian Hills Community College in Iowa, what's the significance of, of his committing to Kansas post bad news yeah um it's interesting Blair because I think it sort of depends on your perspective on this and I think it also sort of depends how KU follows this up because it's not very often that KU starts off with a JUCO commitment and uh, that's the first thing you have to start with for the 2020 class the first guy that KU got to sign up was a guy that is JUCO player and that's just not common for Kansas KU is used to pulling out the top of the top in the high school classes for good reason JUCO guys have kind of seen a little bit more as risks most of the time having said that um, Grant Foster in particular there are some very nice things being said about him and he sort of does seem to kind of fit the mold of a late bloomer and kind of a versatile player on the perimeter and if you look at the uh, the list that he has and again sometimes a little bit dangerous but uh, K-State, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Arkansas, Georgia, LSU, Miami, Mississippi, Oregon. I mean, this this is not a list of schools where it's where, where KU is competing against uh, teams that they're not normally competing against. So it seems like his services were wanted out there. And again, the fact that he is a local kid probably helped KU uh, in, in their favor there. But it is also it causes you to pause a little bit because we know what's out there with Kansas basketball right now. We know potentially there could be NCAA sanctions coming. Um, the five level one violations that were announced uh, allegations with the notice of allegations that came out a couple weeks ago. So for Bill Self and staff, it's been a struggle to recruit in the last year because of having to deal with that and the stigma of that. And so he's even mentioned, hey, you might have to turn more to JUCO guys or turn more to maybe different avenues than they have before. So to start off this class with a JUCO player, I think that is where you first start with this. But then you take a step back and say, hey, it seems like a lot of people were after this kid and that he could be a very solid contributor in either right. So, uh, again, it kind of depends on your perspective, glass half empty, glass half full. But this is definitely something different than what we've seen from Kansas in the past. Here's his quote in the story written by Gary Bedore about what, how Kansas communicated the NCAA inquiry. Mm -hmm. uh, quote, they were right up front about it. They told me all the possibilities that could happen. Coach Self said he'd handle it, Grant Foster told Gary Bedore in a, in a phone interview. So it, it sounds like um, that, uh, you know, Bill Self laid it out for him. So this is, these are possibilities, and, and it didn't deter Grant Foster from uh, from signing with Kansas, as you said, he is not. And this isn't a player for 1920. He is on the uh, you pencil him in on the 2020 2021 roster, which could look decidedly different. Um, you know, when we talk about how that roster shapes up because of the potential loss, there are a lot of guys that aren't going to be on the 2021 team that are playing this year. And you can understand why Bill Self would want to lock some guys in just because of that. I mean, you can go down the line. We can go very quickly here. Devon Dotson, probably gone. Hudo Kazabuki, gone. Sylvia DeSosa, probably gone. Uh, Ochai Abaji, there's a possibility. Isaiah Moss is going to be gone. So, yeah, I mean, right off the bat there, that's five guys without even looking into people like Jalen Wilson, potentially, David McCormick. Um, so KU's got a lot of... A lot of roster spots it's going to need to fill, so you can understand why Bill Self would want to lock someone like this in, just because at some point, 
he's got some work to do. There's going to have to be more than one guy brought in for Kansas uh, to replenish some of the talent that's going to be lost after this season. We might get to know more here. That there's an interesting one coming up this week, and maybe some of our listeners here will know the result of this by the time it comes out. But um, pay attention to Isaiah Todd. He is down to both KU and Michigan. This is a, a real recruit here, like a top 15 sort of recruit. Again, KU is making a final push on him, visiting him, and same sort of thing that you mentioned, Blair, um, with Tyon, that Bill Self has kind of said, hey, let me handle this, uh, the NCAA violations thing, the potential allegations, uh, you know, I'm going to be the one that handles that. But it's, I think it has to be difficult for Self in this scenario just because for the players coming back this year, let's say Devon Dotson or Yudoka Azubuki, he knew all along that this year was not going to be affected it's a little bit tougher to promise that for next year because the next year is an unknown and two years after that is an unknown and we don't know what the NCAA is going to rule or the uh, you know Committee on Infractions is going to rule for Kansas with these 5 level one violations. But that'll be an interesting one to track as well because that is the type of player that KU usually gets, you know, kind of in the Quentin Grimes type of mold where, hey, you got a top 15 sort of recruit. These are the guys that KU usually can lock up here in the fall period. If KU is able to pull a guy from Michigan, uh, you know, away from Michigan as a finalist, uh, in this scenario, then boy, Bill Self is really able to do some great work in recruiting, even in a tough scenario. If that one goes the other way, then again, it might just be an indication that things are going to change a little bit for Kansas and recruiting. And I think a lot of people would have expected that here from the outset. Michigan with new coach Juwan Howard too, yes. with the uh, you know old uh, Fab Five Five hero uh, coaching them for the first for the first time. Next time we talk to you, Jesse, Kansas will have gone through Big Twelve Media Days at uh, at Sprint Center. That is uh, a week from Wednesday, and Kansas has already gone through one media session. They had their school's basketball media day um, last week. Did anything come out of there that uh, surprised you or you know, opened your eyes a little bit? Uh, I, I thought Bill Self was, you know, handled handled the the, the NCAA information about the, the way you'd have expected him to. Didn't. Didn't run away from questions. Maybe not. Didn't answer them as completely as you might have wanted, but did, did what he, I, I guess, had to do in, on the occasion. Yeah, um, I know a lot of Kansas fans, and and we all, I think, suffer from this. Sometimes we sort of get locked into our own worldviews and being around people that are like us, and maybe not understanding the full scope of what's going on here. Um, this is the first media day I've attended, and somebody up there asked me, like, how many K basketball media days have you been to? And I go, oh boy. You know, <laughs> maybe like 12 to 15-ish. So, I mean, I've been up there for a lot of them. I mean, that's what happens when you hang around here and you've covered this team for uh, most of your adult life. But ESPN's Mark Schwartz was there, um, a journalist who is well-known. You often see him asking questions at the NBA Finals. And he was the one that was directly asking Bill Self a lot of those questions. And so I think a lot of Kansas fans think, oh, some of the Snoop Dogg stuff that happened, you know, you brush it off. It's not a big deal. National media members are overblowing it. Local media members are overblowing it. I'm just telling you, ESPN hasn't sent a guy and a film crew to Kansas to do these type of stories. And so I think what you can expect from Bill Self at Big 12 Media Days is a little bit more of the same like that, just that this is going to be an uncomfortable situation for a while. I mean, these are going to be questions that he continues to get asked. Now, Listen, Kay, you couldn't ask for a better person to handle that because I've said many, many years that Bill Self could do about anything he wanted to do in life. He's just sharp. He's quick-witted. He's really good on his feet um, discussing anything that kind of gets thrown at him. So as you said, Blair, I thought he handled himself pretty well in that scenario. I just don't think that this is the sort of thing that immediately will blow over, and especially in a preseason type of setting. These are going to be the type of questions that Bill Self is going to get asked over and over and over again. You know, um, what was meant by the Snoop Dogg concert? What was meant by the Big Adidas T-shirt? You know, are they trying to quote put the middle finger up at the NCAA? Those sorts of things. So I know KU fans. I've heard them on Twitter or Facebook or wherever that they get frustrated that these storylines kind of keep recirculating. But that's going to happen in these sort of media sessions because as you see more reporters and more national reporters involved in the story. I mean, this was a very very big newsy thing and that lasted more than a 24-hour news cycle when Snoop Dogg came down Fieldhouse and KU obviously had um, some of the video things that we discussed in last week's podcast I encourage right. people to go and check that out too so I think this is going to last for a little while and I also think that more than anything Bill Self's ready for some games to get going because once that happens we all get a little bit distracted we all get focused on the team and everything like that and there will be a distraction but up until that point I think Bill Self is going to have to answer a few more questions it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable but as I said before he's always handled himself very well in those situations okay uh 
Football, the Jayhawks travel to Texas. They catch the Longhorns coming off a tough loss in the Red River rivalry to Oklahoma, and they do so with the new offensive coordinator, Brent Dearman, who we, we did discuss him last week and what he may bring to, uh, to Kansas in the offense. What we now know he also brings is a contract that indicates uh, the, the Jayhawks and Les Miles' confidence in him. Uh, two, two, two plus years on the deal? Yeah. Uh, so, again, we pulled that contract through an open records request. I think a lot of people thought, hey, he's going to get the rest of the year to kind of audition for this job. Maybe K will hire him and extend him beyond that point. Well, that's not what the contract is. He has two and a half guaranteed years. Now, the um, guaranteed salary is lower than the previous offensive coordinator, so perhaps KU could make an earlier move if they wanted to. He's only going to make $250,000 base salary per year for these two and a half years, whereas uh, Les Kenning was making $500,000 per year. So maybe that's easier to make a move there, but it indicates to me that KU doesn't think that this is a six-game trial. This is something, hey, they've signed up for him for two and a half years, and then after that, there are actually four what I would call team options as we kind of relate relate them in baseball yep. where KU can just continue to sign him for his current contract if they decide to do so. So uh, a lot of details in that contract. People can check that out at KansasCity.com. Some interesting things with if he leaves Kansas, he owes them a half a million dollars. If he goes to another like assistant coaching job, that is null and void if he leaves for an FBS head coaching job. So they're allowing him if he gets that opportunity and is that good at his job to uh, to go and pursue that. But, you know, some other small things in there. There are some one-time incentives and then some incentives that will boost him up and continue to pay him more with his salary. And those include some things I think that we laughed at at LSU and Alabama, but things that are very real uh, accolades for Kansas, like six wins in a season or a bowl game and those sorts of things. So if, if he has success and if Kansas has success, then uh, Brent Dearman will get a little bit of extra cash to put in his pocket, and he'll probably have deserved that. So um, like I said, some fascinating details in there. People can check out all the, the details in our story on KansasCity.com. But for now, it indicates to me that this is not a six-game trial for Brent Dearman. Les Miles and then also Athletic Director Jeff Long, they have put their confidence and faith in him that he can move this thing going forward. And if not, KU is going to have to be on the hook for another payout uh, to get somebody else in here to run the offense. Story is also in in the show notes. One of my favorite clauses is the $40,000 guaranteed for finishing fifth in the Big 12 in scoring offense with a 20K increase for every position above that. And how many teams there are in the Big 12, uh, Blair? Uh, 10. So uh, if you're average or just above <laughs> average, uh, I also, uh, you know, it's funny reading these contracts because my mind always goes to not conflict of interest, but like you think of incentives, you know, in baseball it happens all the time. Hey, if I get my 600th at bat, I get 25,000 extra dollars. So a guy is incentivized to stay in. For Brent Dearman, we'll see it this week against Texas, but we've heard a lot this week about KU emphasizing tempo, tempo, tempo. Well, here's one way to get yourself up in scoring average, Blair. You know what we do? You go faster and you get more possessions. More so uh, again, not to say that Brent Dearman is doing anything to get himself a $40,000 increase or whatever the case may be, but uh, again, um, KU is going to be more likely to score more points per game if they get more possessions per game and have the ball more often per game. So sort of an interesting thing in there. You know, they could have used yards per game. They could have used yards per play. That's probably what I would have used. But um, instead, they use points per game. So if KU speeds this thing up a little bit more than we saw under Les Kenning, I don't think anybody should be surprised. All right, Jesse. Thanks for stopping by. All right. Appreciate it, Blair. When we return, Vahe Gregorian joins me to talk Mizzou football. And that offer I mentioned at the top of the show, here's how that happens. Hey, it's Blair. Hey, we have a special subscription offer for Sportsbeat KC listeners, unlimited digital access to the Kansas City Stars award-winning sports coverage. Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns we have to offer. And it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. For your convenience, your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at 50 bucks, unless you tell us to cancel. A lot of subscription services won't tell you that. They'll just sneak it on there. We just told you. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star. Please visit KansasCity.com slash SportsBeatKC offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Vahe Gregorian, he's here. 
How you doing, Vahi? That's an achievement in itself, isn't it? If I keep you waiting like a, a woman scorned. <laughs> I, 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 you were bu you were busy, like... busy, busy with the Chiefs today. We are recording this on, on Tuesday afternoon and playing it on Wednesday through the magic of the podcast. And it is magic, podcast magic. You know, I'm struck by how magical you've made it no, by embracing it as you have. There's something, there's something happening with you. Well, what's happening is you're doing the podcast or you're getting the hell out of here. <laughs> that, was, that was the deal that I agreed to. <laughs> Happily. Huh? Okay. <laughs> right. so, so that, uh, but enough about us. <laughs> Let's talk Mizzou, Vahe, and a, uh, a nice win for the Tigers. They were a big favorite, and they won by double digits over Ole Miss on Saturday night. They have Vanderbilt coming up on uh, this weekend. Again, when we when we saw the Missouri schedule beginning of the season, we thought they could have a pretty nice record going into the teeth of the schedule, which really doesn't come until at least after Vanderbilt. And they have built a record nice enough to get into the polls finally. Yeah, and and look, good on them, well deserved. Especially, just look at the way they've played these last five games. I know uh, you know Mississippi played a little catch up there in, in the second half, but it it was never a um, one score game. Uh, at the end, and, and, you know, it's never over till it's over, but Missouri was going to win that game, and and that was a little tighter than, than the rest of their recent games have been, but um, I had a little side contact with Coach Odom last week, and he he felt that uh, this would be one of their biggest, if not biggest, challenges until the uh, Georgia game in some ways, and I think that's telling it, and, and thus they complete the five-game homestand with five straight wins, schedule oddity that now has them after five straight home games, three straight on the road. Yeah, and uh, after starting the season on the road with the with the loss at Wyoming, and doesn't the uh, among those five wins, doesn't the South Carolina victory look better now it, it after does. what the Gamecocks did this weekend? That moved because South Carolina defeated Georgia between the hedges. I might add that means there's only one team without a loss in conference play in the SEC East. Well. It, that, that is what it means. And it also speaks to what we can say right here, right now about Missouri, with the exception of that bizarre quirk at the start of the season now. But, but let's just say they're trending this way. They're coming to play every week. This does not look like the type of team that will let down. Now, you know, these are young, young people playing football. You never know exactly, right? But I think, I think it speaks to Barry having their attention. I don't know why he didn't have their attention or whatever the heck it was that Wyoming game. But I, I dare say if they played them today, they'd beat Wyoming handily, but yep. you know, it doesn't matter. They lost to them then. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't. And, and that, that prevented them from getting in the polls earlier and climbing higher. I suspect if, if Missouri was undefeated now, they'd be in the top 10 uh, as it stands, Florida and Georgia are both like nine and 10, I believe in the, in the AP poll, Missouri is 22 and um, and I think that's the sort of the general consensus of the pecking order of the SEC East, you know Georgia, Florida in some order, and and, and then Missouri. Although with South Car you know South Carolina's win over Georgia certainly uh, muddles it a little bit. But hey, look if you're Missouri, you're happy to be in the polls. It comes with some recognition. It's regular season. Um, you, you like the recognition, and. It, you know, it, it, it puts a little bounce in the step of a program when you got a national ranking next year. And, look, I, I don't, I'm not calling for a letdown this weekend against Vanderbilt. I wouldn't be surprised if they came out a little lethargic after a, a win over a, a Mississippi team that, um, that had beaten – I think they've already beaten Vanderbilt pretty handily this year. But, I, but Missouri, it's not a game that I'm thinking upset alert or anything – so the, the real challenges come, would come after that with Kentucky, Georgia, Florida. I forget the order. Kentucky's the one after. Yeah, and it's the, Vanderbilt, Kentucky, Georgia. Then the one I, I couldn't remember. Yeah, it's, so it's at Vanderbilt, at Kentucky, at Georgia. Now, initially enough, that at Georgia is after Missouri's bye week. Yeah, and, and the Georgia and is after the their Florida game, Georgia, right? Georgia-Florida game. Um, and then Missouri plays host to Florida and Tennessee, and then at Arkansas. I think... It's to Missouri's advantage in a way that, that they're playing at Vanderbilt this week just because it, it's a different sort of attention that has to be called to this by the coaching staff. I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe it would be just fine if they were playing at home. But I do think this, it's, a good, it's a good time for that to work for Missouri. The, this, this, is a, this is a good time for this game to be on the road. 
Okay, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I think there's something to that. It gives him a little, you know, the maybe the worst team in the SEC coming to your place after you've come off a, yeah. you know, an easy win. Maybe be tough for players to get focused. I think it's 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 less of a challenge to get them to focus when they go on the road against any opponent, really. I think that's right. I think it really lends itself to that in this case. And I think also, it, look, again, we could I could be disproven on this soon, but I, it – Somehow or another, this is a team playing with a purpose. And, of course, the, the lurking twist over this whole thing is the NCAA stuff, which is, you know, I, I, another reason I give Barry Odom so much credit, right? I mean, nobody left, and he's, he's kept their heads in the game without really knowing what is at stake, actually. They don't really know what they can do. They literally have no idea what the ceiling can be because of that. It's, it's actually a... A reason, if you, if you're looking for one, that coaches say all the time tell us that you know they're they're week to week. Well, with Missouri, because they don't know what's beyond the regular season, uh, you can sell that idea pretty easily. You know, yeah. all you have is the next game, and yeah. because because if if the NCAA ends up not accepting Missouri's appeal, they won't play beyond the Arkansas game. They're not going to be in the SEC. They wouldn't be in the SEC championship game if they won the East. There would be no bowl appearance for the Tigers um, if if the NCAA finds holds upholds the, uh, the 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 bowl ban. So I, I think in that regard, if you're Barry Odom and the coaching staff, you can convince your team that all you've got is next the next game. That's all. It's all you got, and the only people that believe in you're in this room, and all that stuff that we right, that we sometimes right. laugh at. Right. But I think it, it can work for Missouri. Uh, and put another way, and really, in, in as many words, it, you're really striking me with this. Really, it actually lends itself to that quite perfectly, right? I mean, used properly, this is a coach's dream. We are week to week. Mm-hmm. All that all we care about is this game because this game is our season. Because we don't know what the rest of the season can bring. So you know, revel in the moment, right? I mean, I, I think that's that's pretty interesting. And I don't know what exact words or terms Barry has used with the team. I just know that at every checkpoint of this, he has been there with what has come to strike me as a really good pitch and presence. With I, I've seen him come more and more into his own just in his dealings with the media, and I'm certain that's a direct translation with how how comfortable he is with his team as well. I know you've been impressed with him in post-game scenarios. I, I have, and, and I wasn't the first couple of years. I was, I, same with me. Yeah, yeah. Yep. and, I, and I, I, I really didn't like that blow-up thing. And I, I, Yeah, there were I, a couple of them yeah, uh, and, and, early on. And, yes, I, and, and uh, I just thought this was a guy reaching, overcompensating, didn't know who he was. And look, all our pendulums swing a little bit till we get to where we are, I think, right? And, and I, I think that's sort of what's happened with him. And I think he's really at ease in his own skin, and I think I've seen this turn happen in about the last two years. I think he's felt just more comfortable in the seat, and I think he has um, absolutely felt like he has gotten the culture where he wants it, and with that, the people around him that he wants, both in terms of guys they recruit, but also you know shaping and molding that coaching staff to be guys he feels, I think, real faith in. Okay, so it's a 3 p.m. kick on Saturday, uh, Missouri at Vanderbilt. Uh, basketball season is on the doorstep here, and Missouri is going through its, um, you know, its various media days and media opportunities uh, this this time of year. There, the SEC media days is are Wednesday. Uh, the preseason poll is out. The Tigers were picked 13th, and there are 14 teams in the SEC. So I didn't see who was picked last, but uh, Missouri was uh, right above them. I don't know. Look, the Tigers were five and thirteen a year ago. It was not a you know not a happy season in Columbia, but a lot of, a lot of folks returned. You know, a lot of a lot of points and rebounds are back for Missouri, and um, I, I know they're excited about the recruits, and I know they're pretty excited about Drew Smith, the transfer point guard who looks like he's going to step yeah. right in. And I, I think there's more reasons to be to feel better about Missouri than um, than what's projected. By, yeah, by the, the media who covers the, the SEC. I think that's right. I think a couple things are going on here, right? In, in general, the SEC quality of play has gone up. It's not sort of that SEC of I'm making this time frame up, but let's say seven, eight, nine years ago, where you felt like it's 
Kentucky, Florida, and that's it. Yeah, right. It, I mean, I, I agree with that for sure. So I think you know the coaching's improved and Heck, things Auburn, like that. Auburn in the Final Four last year, South Carolina, yes, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah, and so so you can come out of the SEC and and have a different name than the traditional ones, and some and and the baseline's better. The baseline's better, but I do wonder also if it's still a mentality covering the SEC or watching the SEC that you know, you've yet to see Missouri make its real move in this conference, right? You just haven't. and Not, not since the first year. They, they, yeah. were in the, they were in the NCAA tournament the first year. Um, and then again with Conzo one yeah, year. One year with Conzo. But the, the, out right away. The, the Porter year. Yeah. So out I right away both on both occasions. In a, in a way, it's, it's a bit of a weigh in on just Missouri in general, which, you know, fair enough for the show me state to have to show it. But it, sort of, as you noted, just with the idea of Drew Smith, it, some, one guy can change a basketball team a little bit. Maybe that allows people to get in their more appropriate spots a little bit. The funny twist on this is that losing one guy the last couple of years has been pretty crucial. Uh, losing a porter early yep. has changed the dynamic. Maybe, maybe we'll see that they've got enough maturity, enough depth that they don't have to have one guy you know, that, that makes the difference, but that they can get into the right spots if, if things fall their way for once. So I, I certainly wouldn't think they're 13th best team in that conference, but you know, I guess they have to earn it. I think that's right. And um, I'm excited to see them in Kansas City in um, Thanksgiving, what, the, the weekend before Thanksgiving in the, in the Hall of Fame Classic uh, with Oklahoma, Stanford, and Butler, I think, are the teams in, in the tournament here. So that'll be fun. Okay, Vahe, thanks for dropping by. Thanks, Blair. The stories written by Kellis, Jesse, Vahe, and everybody else at the Star can be found on KansasCity.com, and the ones we talked about today are in the show notes. Thanks to Kathy Liu and Leah Becerra for stitching together these conversations. And as always, thanks for listening to Sports BKC, the Star's daily sports podcast. We'll be back on Thursday with another episode. Recording. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da.